Okay, it looks like the numbers are starting to slow down of people joining. So we are going to start the webinar here. So welcome and thank you for joining us for Grazing Game Plan, how to develop a grazing game plan. My name is Sydney Fortier. I'm the Interim Extension Coordinator for BCRC and I will be your moderator this evening. Um, um, we are very happy to put on this free webinar series through the Knowledge Dissemination and Technology Transfer Project funded by the Canadian Beef Cattle Checkoff and Canada's Beef Science Cluster. Um, so we encourage you to submit any questions you may have through the Q&A function. Do not put them in the chat, um, otherwise we will not be able to get to them at the end of our presentations. Um, but we do encourage you guys to have chats in the chat, and um, if some sort of link gets mentioned, I will be able to throw that in there as well for you guys. Um, and just a reminder that this webinar will be recorded, and a recording link will be sent to everyone who has registered for the webinar series, and not just those who have attended this evening. So for those of you who haven't already, we highly encourage you to subscribe to our blog. So we share new research, time relevant information and updates on what the BCRC has been up to. So for example, for the past couple of weeks, we have been um, launching our CAF 911 series where we kind of go over the realities of calving and what happens when things don't really go as planned. So we have vid um, videos on calf resuscitation, tube feeding, dehydration, and as well as colostrum management. So if you're interested in any of these topics, subscribe to the blog, or they're also on our YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, we're sharing new content like this fairly often. So subscribe to the blog, and then you also get um, the timely information on um, research that we have, and as well as resources that we have on our site. So one of those resources in particular that is on theme for this evening is our carrying capacity calculator. So I'm just going to show you guys where that lives and what it looks like. So under our resources tab, there's our decision-making tools. And we have a ton in here that just kind of help you, um, well, it takes your on-farm information and puts it into a calculator of different varieties and helps you to have make informed decisions on your operation. So for our carrying capacity calculator, um, this is what it looks like. And so carrying capacity is also known as grazing capacity. Um, it's the amount of forage available for grazing animals in a specific pasture or field. So understanding how much forage is available is a key principle of pasture management in order to balance the available forage supply with your livestock's demand. Uh, carrying capacity can be calculated using a variety of techniques and for the most part it is um, based on trial and error. Um, but carrying capacity can be monitored and adjusted over time to determine the long-term average of um, particular fields or your grazing management system. So this calculator is broken down into two methods. So the first method is using the provincial production guides um, in terms of the forage yields that is in your region. Um, and this you um, determine pasture condition um, in step one, and then determine your estimated forage yield, calculate your available forage, calculate the number of pairs or yearlings that can graze, um, and then some additional regional information. For the second method, this is where it's getting a little bit more hands-on. So you cut, dry, and weigh samples from your own pasture in order to calculate your carrying capacity for that particular field. So here we have um, our sampling instructions, um, then the dry sort, weigh, and record. And this is where you enter your information, which calculates your available forage, um, calculate the number of pairs of yearlings that can graze, and then you get your results. So it's just an interesting little tool to help you, um, yeah, just make informed decisions based on actual information from either your region or from your particular operation. 
back in here. So this webinar series, we're also um, giving continuing education credits. So unfortunately, this webinar does not offer a CE credit, but our next one, which is um, rolling the dice with Yone's disease is, um, and our past two, you can still get your CE credits by watching the recording and then answering the quiz. Um, and that'll stay live for um, after our webinar series as well. So if you're interested or you have any questions about getting your certificate, um, please reach out to either myself, Sydney Fortier, or Dana Parker. So without further ado, we have a great lineup of speakers for you this evening. We have Christine O'Reilly out of Ontario and Lucette Campbell and Jeremy Brown out of Saskatchewan. And yeah, I guess without further ado, I'm going to pass the floor over to Christine. So Christine um, O'Reilly is the Forage and Grazing Specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Her areas of focus include the benefits of forages and grazing within cropping systems, forage production and grazing systems for Northern Ontario, and improving the productivity and profitability of forages. Christine joined the ministry in 2017 and is based out of the Lindsay office. So please join me in welcoming Christine O'Reilly. Um, Christine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sydney. And thank you so much everybody for having me here this evening. Um, when I was asked to be one of the speakers this evening and we were talking about developing a grazing plan, I got thinking back on some of the other sessions about planning grazing that I'd attended and I realized none of them were actually on planning. Um, some of them were on record keeping, which is very important, but not the same thing. Record keeping is accurately looking back at what's happened planning is looking ahead. So that's an important topic, but a different topic. And some of the others were on setting up rotational grazing systems because some people also call that plant grazing is another term for rotational grazing. So neither of those quite encompassed what I want to cover with you guys this evening. So I really want to kind of step back, take a look at the big picture, pull us out of the day-to-day -day details of just running the farm, running the ranch, and sort of think about that bigger picture in terms of the plan, because I know my co-presenters are going to take us back down into those details um, and some of the practical hands-on stuff. So with that in mind, we're going to think big picture in the beginning. So what makes a grazing plan? When we're talking about planning, really it's about thinking ahead. So if you if you look up the definition of plan, you get something along the lines of um, a proposal for doing or achieving something, a decision about what you're going to do. All of these are future tense. It's thinking about what hasn't happened yet, but how you might deal with those things. And when we're diving into that planning process, to my mind, there are three categories of things that we could plan around. So the first category is setting some goals. What are some goals for the grazing enterprise on your operation? The second one is coming up with some guidelines for common management decisions. And the third one is framework for managing some uncommon situations, things that don't come up regularly, but when they do come up, they have a big impact. And we're going to go through these and, and dive into them each a little bit further. So starting with goals, um, there's lots of guidelines out there in terms of different ways to set goals, but one very common one for setting goals that you're actually gonna achieve is called the SMART method. So SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And basically each of those words um, is there to help provide more detail and more structure to your goals because having all of that information built into a goal makes it much more likely that you're actually going to achieve it. So when we talk about specific goals, answering the questions, what, why, who, where, which, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Who's going to make that happen? Um, 
where may not be quite as relevant in in a pasture setting because probably that goal is going to happen on your pasture ground um, but answering those kinds of questions really makes a goal specific measurable is very important because if you can't measure what you're working towards how do you know that you've got there um, and i mentioned that planning and record keeping are not the same thing but i really do think that the measurable part of a smart goal provides insight in some, into what records you should be keeping about your pasture. I've got a couple of example goals in a moment that will illustrate that point a little bit further. To make sure that your goal is achievable, it really helps to outline the steps that are involved. So really getting into the details of how are you gonna make that happen? What, what do you have to do? And sometimes that means rather than starting from where you are and working towards the end goal, sometimes that means starting at the goal and working backwards to where you're at and figuring out, okay, to get there, I have to do this, but to do that, I need something beforehand. So figuring out all of those individual steps and making sure that those steps are very clear. Relevant, relevant basically just means it's aligning with overall what directions your operation going in. Where, what, what is, what is of value to you? What do you value? What, where, where's your operation heading? Um, and that's kind of vague and is sort of hard if you haven't thought about that or haven't had those conversations, but um, you don't want a pasture goal that's working in one direction when the rest of your management is going in a different direction. And then time bound, setting a deadline really helps keep up some of that momentum and encourage you to get it done. Cause it's one thing to say, oh, I really want to, achieve this, but it's another thing to say, okay, if we're going to make this happen in the next three years, we got to get cracking. Um, some other things to keep in mind, I'd encourage you, please set at least one goal for your pasture because it is such a key piece of most of our operations. Um, but I would suggest limiting yourself to no more than three to five, just because we do want them to be achievable. And if you've got too many goals on the go, something might get lost a little bit through the cracks. So that's the breakdown of what each of those um, criteria in that acronym mean, but let's actually apply some possible pasture goals to that and see what that might look like on a farm. So lots of producers I talk to say, I want more pasture. That in and of itself is not a goal. It's a great motivator, but it's not the goal. So if we get more specific, how, how could you have more pasture? There's lots of different ways. You could buy or rent more land, but that can be hard to find depending on where you are. It could be out of budget. So let's look at increased pasture yield. That's a little bit more specific. We're going to focus on the ground that we've got. We're going to try to increase pasture yield. How will we know that we've done that? Let's set something that's measurable to it. So if we increase pasture yield by 10% over our current average yield, that would let us know that we've got there, right? That's something that we could measure, but it also tells us what records we need to be keeping. If you don't know what your pasture yield is right now, but your goal is to increase your pasture yield, you need a baseline measurement first. Because if you don't know what your yield is now, you won't be able to tell if what you've done has actually increased your pasture yield. So to me, this says with this specific goal, one of the records you need to be keeping on that pasture is pasture yield. In terms of making it achievable, there's lots of different ways you could go about increasing pasture yield. One of them would be implementing a fertility plan. Um, so you could break that one down even further. First, you're going to need a current soil test. Then you're going to need to take a look at what manure you've got on site. Probably a manure test is a good idea there as well. Then you know what nutrients are in it. Um, then you've got to figure out, okay, what's the best time of year to apply that manure? When can I get out on the land? Will I have the equipment lined up? Do I need to bring in a custom contractor? Maybe your manure is not going to meet the fertility needs of that crop. Okay, now we've got to top up with some purchased fertilizer. How much? What's the going price? <laughs> How am I going to budget for that? So there's a lot of different steps to implementing a fertility plan. I just didn't have room on the slide. That's one approach. Another approach could be overseeding thin pastures with productive species. What those species look like depends on where in the country you are. Um, but, you know, Figuring out, okay, what's going in that mix? What seeding rate should I be using? What equipment have I got? Am I gonna broadcast and pack it? Is it thin enough that's gonna work? Frost seeding is a great option. Um, maybe you've got access to a no-till drill. Those are all different ways to thicken up some of those pastures without actually turning that ground over and starting from scratch. 
maybe you're going to really focus on providing enough rest and recovery time between grazing events because making sure that you're not overgrazing could be another way to help improve pasture yields. So really breaking that down, maybe that's record keeping on grazing periods, rest periods, trying to map that out a little bit better and staying on top of that. So that could be other records if that's the route you choose to go. So some of these individually or a few of these different approaches in collaboration. There are other things you might choose to do to increase pasture yield. My point is this is an example of just starting to think about what would be involved and breaking it all down in terms of, of the many steps to get to that goal. Um, is it relevant? For this particular example, increasing pasture yields could reduce reliance on stored forage, which is more expensive. So maybe your farm goals are related to widening profit margins that would align with that kind of a farm goal maybe it's uh related to i don't know your your housing systems when when you have cattle in the barn versus outside some of those things that could align with with a broader farm goal like that so um, it's hard to say exactly in an example that's just on pasture because we don't have one farm here that we're talking about for those overall goals but i think you can make the leap to your own operations to say, okay, does a goal like this align with what we're doing on our farm? And time bound, setting a deadline. Um, for example, here, I've said five years from now, but really include dates when you're setting your goals. Like when you go back and take a look, you know exactly when that deadline is. Um, the reason for this particular one, I said five years is because we went with current average yield as our measurement. So to get average, we need more than just one year of data. We need maybe more than just two years of data. So if we have a couple of years at the beginning to do our benchmark and a few years down the road, we take some more yield data and we can come up with our new number, that makes measuring a little bit easier to see if we actually hit that target. So that's one example. What about a different example? I'm still hearing producers say, I want more pasture, but a different way to go about that could be a goal to lengthen the grazing season or just increase total days grazing. So how do you know you've met that goal? Maybe your target is to lengthen that grazing season by two weeks over your current average. So that tells me that the record keeping you'd need to do to hit that is really make sure that you're tracking how many days those cattle are grazing and how many days you're feeding stored forage. And if you're feeding stored forage, say in the summer slump, that's days on stored forage, that's not days grazing. So it's not just necessarily the shoulder seasons where you might have an opportunity to increase the number of days you're grazing. You could also potentially be looking at the middle of the grazing season too. How would you achieve that? Again, my bullet points don't go into as much detail as ideally um, you should consider putting into these kinds of goals, but um, think about better grass budgeting. So monitoring that grass, how much grass is there when you turn in the cattle? How much grass is there when you take them out? Making sure that you're getting that, that rest period and the, the graze period lined up so that you've got good recovery time. Um, you could also think about getting creative about where you're grazing and what crops you're grazing to lengthen the, the grazing season, particularly into the fall, but sometimes into the spring. Um, so that could be done by grazing crop residues or annual forages, cover crops, those kinds of things. So that getting creative there might also help lengthen that grazing season or increase your grazing days. Um, again, for the aligning with farm goals, I went with reducing reliance on more expensive stored forage, which may align with a variety of overall farm goals. Um, and time bound, again, I set something that's not just this year, but a little bit longer because I'm talking about over current average. So that's just because of the data we would need to tell that we got that goal. That's not saying that they're aren't goals you could achieve in a single grazing season. There absolutely are, uh, but the examples I came up with off the top of my head tended to need a little more than one season just to, to really make sure that that data could be captured so we could measure success. All right, the second component, the broad category of things to consider putting in a plan are common management decisions. So this is more helping you make sure you're clear in your own mind um, or if you're working with other people whether it's family or employees or business partners that you can also articulate how we're making these common management decisions so if you can answer questions like how do you know 
when it's time to move cattle out of a paddock, when a paddock's ready to be grazed, when to bring cattle to a wintering location, if a paddock could be cut for hay or baleage instead of grazed. If you can answer these questions, these are things that are likely to come up during the grazing season. And those of you that have been grazing for a while, you probably already know the answers to these. It's just making sure that you could explain it to someone else in case someone else for some reason is managing the cattle. Maybe you're off sick, maybe you decide to take a vacation, but at least it's very clear when you're making those kinds of decisions. Some other ones that might come up very likely during the year. Um, if the next paddock in the rotation isn't fully recovered yet, what are you gonna do? What do you do if the paddock's too wet to carry livestock for a little bit? You know, so there's, there's different options. There's lots of ways that you might handle that situation, but what's your preference on your farm based on, you know, the infrastructure you've got, the labor you've got, the equipment. Those are things that, uh, yeah, if you've thought it out and you know how you're gonna handle that and why, that's a good part of your plan. It's something that you could articulate to someone else if for some reason they're doing chores instead of you. So the third category, is planning for emergencies, for adverse weather, for uncommon things that we hope we don't have to deal with ever. We probably will have to deal with at some point, um, but it's not something we would expect to deal with even every year. So this one, um, I know probably resonates particularly strongly with um, anyone who's been through a situation like that this year, and I know there's lots of us on this call. Um, one piece of advice I would give is if you're dealing with the uh, with a situation like that, that's probably not the one to be planning for right now. So those of you on the prairies or in Northwestern Ontario that are still working through that drought. I know the growing season's done, but you're still living with the after effects of that drought. Uh, this is probably not a good time to be planning for drought because you, there's still that emotional response. You're still dealing with those stressors. You could plan for flooding. You could plan for hail. You could plan for a down cow in the pasture, all those kinds of things that we hope don't happen. Maybe leave drought out until, you know, we've got next year's forage supply up and at it. Um, if you want to take notes, fine, but maybe don't plan. Same thing if you're in an area of British Columbia that got flooded this year, this might not be the best time to do your flooding plan, but you could do drought and you could do, you know, some of those other things. So the idea with this planning is to really do it when you're calm, it's not affecting you, and you can objectively work through those what if scenarios to help guide your planning. So um, yeah, using scenarios can help figure out what are those decision points as things happen or as things get worse, where do you need to make those decisions? And very often resources from ECRC, from government extension, from um, some of your provincial cattlemen's associations or forage councils, those are great opportunities to find information on what works well in your climate, um, particularly on the crop side, climate's very important. Um, but take a look through their resources, take a look at the kinds of responses they suggest for those situations well before they happen and know where to find them and think about what would you want to do? What's, what's your preferred first option if things continue, if it's a prolonged situation? What is your next trigger point? Where do you have to make decisions and what should those decisions be? Because by planning them out, calmly, objectively, when you're not in the middle of it, can help you feel a little more confident in the decisions you make if that situation does come up. So um, yeah, that's what I had on emergencies and adverse weather. So those are kind of the three broad categories, big picture thinking of things you could put in a plan. Um, potentially this could be very big. So it's not something you have to sit down and do all at once but it is worthwhile thinking about both things that are likely to happen, things that are unlikely, but could be a big deal if they do happen, and where do you wanna go with your grazing operation? So with that, uh, my contact information is up on the screen if anyone has questions for me after the webinar, um, but I'll hand things back to Sydney. And um, are we taking questions now, Sydney, or after all three of us speak? No, we're going to take questions after all three speakers have gone through. But, okay. Yeah. Thanks. 
Uh, thank you very much, Christine. That was great. Um, yeah, it's always great to like bring it back down to the basics and uh, remind ourselves that like a good a good way to know that your management is going to be going smoothly is to make sure that you have a really good plan up like up front and yeah. It's not going to prevent things from happening differently than you had expected, but having a plan also kind of makes it easier to make those changes on the fly. So absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Bluset Campbell. So originally from a sheep ranch in Montana, Bluset lives and works on the BC Ranch, a third generation cattle ranch near Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan, with her husband, Mark, and their two boys, Andrews and Birch. The ranch currently is 700 head cow calf and long yearling operation that includes an extra age heifer enterprise. Lucet has a passion for holistic management and is now an HM certified educator through Holistic Management International. Other places that hold her passions are the no-till garden adventures, chemistry and magic in the kitchen, and advocating for the rights of all individuals, especially those with intellectual exceptionalities, where she spends much of her free time volunteering. Holistic management practices can be seen as a common thread through all of her work, and if you can't, don't find her in any of those places, she is likely out trying to make sense of the world while running. So without further ado, Lucette, you have the floor. Thank you, Sydney. Um, I appreciate the uh, in introduction. Um, <clears throat> all right, let me get started right away and uh, get my timer going so I don't go over, um, have to have my timer in the window. Thank you to rural internet. Um, so I still have service. All right, so Christine just walked you through some um, some goal setting, some reasons um, for con you know considering placing uh, grazing planning, and uh, especially for those adverse um, years. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my presentation. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in the introduction portion here because my bio was read, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So I'm going to talk about fundamentals of plan grazing. Um, or transformational fundamentals. So let's get started. A little bit about our ranch though, is that um, our ranch has been under holistic management practices for about 35 years. That means that we have had some planned grazing for many decades. And at the time uh, we began to look at our animals in a very different way. But we began to consider that these animals could actually be part of the solution of improving the soil or a tool. And that we're not just in the business of raising cattle. We produce microorganisms in the soil. We produce a profit. We're hopefully producing future land stewards. They might be family. They might not be. Not just cows. And that it is printed in our three-part goal or our holistic context that we are determined to leave the land better than we found it. And so, you know, when Christine was talking about goal setting, I really encourage you to consider that quality of life element in your overall farm goals, because for sure your planned grazing will have an impact on your personal resources, for example, how much time you wanna spend. And that is directly connected to your quality of life. Because we have a short amount of time, I am going to focus on particular transformational concepts to consider when thinking about your grazing plan. So I'm going to talk about time. And time, um, talking hours and minutes here, folks. I'm talking about time in concept. There are two concepts, overgrazing and recovery. And Christine touched on both of them. Uh, I'd like to first dig into overgrazing, and I'd like you to consider thinking about overgrazing in a different way, perhaps than you um, than you have thought about in the past. This black and white photo is a really nice visual image, so I'll explain a little bit that the sample on the left that is long is unclipped or un ungrazed sample, and you can see the mirror image effect of you know the 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 growth above is actually mirrored with the um, volume of root mass below. 
And as you move to the right, the next sample is clipped at five inches and the following at three and then one and a half. The significant part of this image is that each of these has a four week interval. So it was clipped or could be grazed to you know, approximately five inches. This is what happens four weeks later at three and you can see what's happening underneath. So overgrazing as a concept of time it has more to do with the, re, um, the amount of time that a, that a plant is allowed to either rest, I'm gonna get right here, um, is allowed to rest in between grazing. So here's, here's maybe a more, a simpler way to think about it is that overgrazing can be defined as either staying too long in one particular paddock where the plants begin to regrow or coming back to a paddock too soon <clears throat> excuse me, too soon and not allowing that plant to recover. And I'll get to that in just a minute. And so, you know, what that magic recovery number is, um, a lot depends on what it is that you're managing for. So overgrazing as a factor of time, not necessarily number of animals per paddock, um, is something to consider. I, I recognize that this may be a little bit of an exercise, um, a psychological you know, gymnastics maneuver for you if you haven't been thinking about it in these terms in the past, but I really encourage you to sort of stretch those muscles. Okay. So I also wanna talk about the time in terms of recovery, which Christine mentioned, which is about that ability for the plant to grow after it has been clipped or grazed. So you can see in this example, this lovely image here, um, I've got quite a nice diverse pasture here. You can see some things are beginning to head out. And growing there. And this is to demonstrate that it has been grazed or clipped. And I'm not going to talk about the magic amount of um, you know, inches to take or to leave behind, but we're going to just talk about this in terms of has been grazed. What happens is after you leave the paddock, is that grass will begin to grow. Or if you don't leave the paddock, the animal leaves the plant and the plant begins to regrow. And this is very tempting. If you see um, the plants will begin to grow, they're very vegetative, and um, likely if an animal is still there, it's gonna come back to that one to graze again. This demonstrates perhaps a, a plant that is in full recovery. So it has had the opportunity or the time to fully mature and to reach a flowering stage. And so what I'm um, suggesting is that recovery has more to do with the stage of the plant and your observations about that plant and less to do with a magic number that I could give you. And that'll vary depending on where your farm is or where your ranch is um, and your growing season. So to go back to the overgraze and to look at the, the plants that are um, mature, it is quite possible to have overgrazed and undergrazed or underdisturbed plants in the same pasture. So um, in the demonstration back here, if you can graze that uh, before the plant has the opportunity to, to grow a seed head, um, it will be nibbled off again. But say there's a, a sagebrush plant right next to it and it doesn't get grazed. So the plant, that's vegetative gets overgrazed and the sagebrush right, right next to it doesn't get grazed at all. And guess what's going to happen? That's a thriving environment for that sagebrush. Now, if that's what you're managing for, that's quite all right. But if you're managing for more grass, you may want to consider that to get back to this fully recovered pasture before moving in. So that's one transformational concept that I wanted to talk about. Another one is ecosystem. And I'm not sure if it's part of your regular vocabulary, but I strongly encourage you to think about the word ecosystem because when you look at your pasture, it's about all things in that pasture. Alan Savory has a really great tool. This comes directly out of the holistic management textbook. And it's a tool to be able to analyze and look at your pasture and determine the health of what's happening out there. And I really think this is a very important piece to, um, to consider uh, when thinking about your grazing planning because you can go out and take a look at uh, four elements. So I'm gonna start here with the energy flow and I'm gonna just breeze through these because we don't have a lot of time. 
but again, I can answer some more questions about them later. So energy flow being the ability to capture solar energy. Um, do you have solar panels out there, meaning like leaves and broad leaves that are able to capture? What happens when the sun comes down? Does it hit bare ground or does it hit a leaf? Next week, water cycle. And um, you may not have uh, influence over how much rain lands on your property, but maybe you have a lot of influence how to increase the effectiveness. So when water droplets land on your land, what happens to them? Do they hit bare ground or do they hit a leaf? Are they running off or are they being absorbed into the soil, into that sponge um, or uh, like thatch? Mineral cycle is something to consider. And what I mean by that is how quickly minerals are recycled back into an available nutrient for the plants. So uh, you could think about um, a cow patty when it drops to the ground, what happens to it? Is it there three to four months later and does it look or feel like cardboard? Or after it hits the ground, does a fly land on it? Are eggs laid? Does, do the ants come over and start taking it? Um, are there dung beetles that are uh, recycling those and bringing those back and making those available to the um, to the plant. Lastly, community dynamics or biodiversity is something to consider. It's the natural progression of things that grow. And so here in our neck of the woods near Meadow Lake, we're near the boreal forest. And so the ideal state in many of these areas is a boreal forest, so trees. So if there's a patch of bare ground here, something, an indicator species that there's bare ground will come up like dandelion, for example, or thistle um, or stinging nettle, depending on the soil composition. Eventually, if left to its own devices, will turn into um, a treed area. So taking account of what's happening and what stage your pasture in is at that time. So these things can be considered and you can go out on the land and uh, take a bottle of water. You could take a pencil and begin to take a look at the health in these four areas. So for example, you throw a pencil, the tip of the pencil hits the ground. Is it on bare ground? or not. And if you did that 10 times, you got a pretty good idea how much bare ground you have. Or you take a metal ring and pour a bottle of water in it. How long does it take for that water to absorb? Maybe it's a really long time. Is that an effective water cycle? Well, that's for you to determine. So I'm ecosystem. Two things strongly consider you think about even before drafting up a grazing plan. A couple of other things. I want to leave with you is if you're considering a grazing plan, there's a few steps that I'd really like you to consider. Number one is if you are overgrazing, so if you're staying too long on one piece or you're coming back too soon to that same piece, you're overgrazing, you're likely overgrazing. So you can do the first step, you can stop that and pick a magic uh, recovery for your place and stick to that in your grazing plan. And there are ways to determine that. I certainly can't tell you what the best number for yours. That's a factor of time. Actually covering the bare ground, that is a factor of the ecosystem. So anytime you have bare ground, you know that it's exposed to you know, sunlight. Direct sunlight can be horrible on bare ground because it increases the temperature and you get a lot of evaporation. So covering that is, is important. Or what happens when that rain drops on there? It could take some of your soil, it can run off. Etc. So these are two things that you can do right away and make some serious improvement to your pasture when you're considering your plan. How do you cover bare ground? We just talked about how you can eliminate the overgrazing. Covering bare ground, it's actually quite simple. Um, not necessarily easy to do, but it is quite simple. The most effective way here on the BBRC Ranch to cover bare ground is to winter feed. Here's a picture of our extra age heifers. You can see they, they were in a bale grazing pod. You can see some of the residual on the ground. Notice I didn't say waste. And they're about to move to the pod in the back. You can see the bales that are um, awaiting them. That is the most effective way and the quickest way to cover the bare ground that we know of. The second way is to harvest in the growing season, harvest less than what you grow. And in the non-dormant season, um, if, you're, uh, if you're grazing after the growing season, this also applies. Um, and what I also really encourage you to do is that if you're leaving 
quite a bit of residual to cover your bare ground, you may consider increasing your stock density so that that doesn't just stand there through the winter and oxidize, that you actually have some animal impact in there to knock that down and to cover some of the bare ground. And by doing so, you're improving your ecosystem and that has a lot of positive impact on your land. It can be sort of wrapped up in this graphic. Some of the same content might reach people in a different way is that improving your soil by stopping the overgrazing and covering the bare ground is improving those ecosystem processes. When you do that, you're increasing the health of the plants. So you'll have darker green plants, which is an indicator of lots of nitrogen. You'll have thicker leaves, they'll be broader. There might be more leaves per plant. Your dandelion leaves might be 19 inches tall and four inches wide. And the plants that are there will be much closer together because they're covering the bare ground. Healthier plants can equal a lot more nutrient dense um, forage. And then when the animals graze that, they often slick off sooner. Um, it can mean increased fertility and uh, you'll see that in their shiny coats. So that's another way of sort of measuring those um, indicators that you're moving in the right direction. But I strongly recommend looking at those four ecosystem processes of energy flow, water, um, nutrients, uh, and mineral cycle, and the biodiversity. So I'd um, just like to show a few pictures. I have a few minutes left here. I know I'm talking really fast, folks, and I'm covering a lot of material, so bear with me here. But uh, everybody likes to see pictures of cows and grass, right? So here's an aerial view um, off of Google Earth of our property. Um, it's about, uh, about 4,000 acres here. You can see the red line is the boundary. We have the lakes up the north, Highway 4 to the east there on the right. The squiggly line is the Beaver River. So we butt, butt right next to that river. And then, of course, on the west side, um, our neighbors, the straight line. Here's what it looks like after we have done our magic with our planned grazing. Um, and this picture is beat up and I, I leave it in my presentation because it is a laminated aerial photo that gets um, folded up and shoved into pockets for all the interns that are learning our, um, our maps. Um, this is just a demonstration of how we realize our planned grazing. There are um, about 4,000 acres, 104 pastures and lots of um, fence lines here. Don't get discouraged. We've had 35 years to, um, to create this. Because everyone loves cows and grass, this is just um, a, a picture illustrating stock density. We really like to see those animals shoulder to shoulder, knocking down the grass that they don't graze. They're manuring and trampling um, much of what they uh, don't eat. And as Christine mentioned, the, uh, the power of planning and planning in years when things um, are not happening to you is such a great idea. This is the view out of our kitchen window. Um, this is also during um, the drought of 2021. It was a pretty significant drought for us here. I also want to show you, this is uh, of the same year, uh, 2021. You can see the browning here uh, down at the bottom there's not a lot of regrowth. We had about 4.9 inches of rain, and this is very close to the 29th of July. So 4.9 inches before July is significantly dry for us. Um, most of that moisture came later, not in the early spring. This is what it like exactly one year before. So this is June 18th of 2020 um, that we experienced a very significant flood. And uh, as you saw the aerial map, um, 70 to 80% of our ranch was underwater for a good portion of time. And that water could be 15 feet deep, depending on where you were. There was a lot of water folks. And I will tell you that um, our ability to move through, not just the pandemic that everyone was experiencing, but a very significant, perhaps, you know, once in my lifetime kind of flood to be fall, we are experiencing an incredible winter and we do have lots of snow this year. Um, our plans have really helped us adapt through those times of adversity and honestly I don't know if we would uh, still be here if we didn't do all that planning. Now I'm going to pass it over to um, 
to Jeremy, but I wanted to leave you with this picture. I'll give you a little bit of background. We were going to have a field day with, uh, I think close to 70 people arriving on the 29th of July last year. And we were feeling pretty down because it was the year of the drought and we, we were showing people how to, how to grow grass. And it felt a little bit odd. I really think we had much. So we went out on a tour and that's always the best way to, you know, perk us up is to go out and see what's going on. We wanted to see where we were going to stop and show the people the cattle and the grass. And we got to this pasture and we're blown away at the production with having, you know, very little rain for us here. Um, this pasture was producing amazing amounts. And I really do attribute that to our ability to plan to stop any overgrazing and to really allow recovery for our biodiversity to thrive, to build that thatch and soil, create great ecosystems for all the microorganisms underneath. Um, there's a lot to consider, folks. So thank you very much for your time. I uh, really appreciate you being here this evening to listen, and I'll be happy to answer questions later. Back to you, Sydney. Thank you very much for that presentation, Blue Set. That was very insightful. Thank you. Um, we are going to pass it along to Jeremy Brown. So Jeremy is a professional agrologist with over 18 years experience in the areas of pasture, water, and livestock management. He enjoys learning from and providing advice to producers from all over the prairies with a focus on grazing management and source water development. He has also worked extensively with government and conservation organizations on land management. Jeremy received a degree in agriculture from the University of Saskatchewan. He was raised on a grain and cattle farm near Rock Haven, Saskatchewan, and he now lives on a Century Farm homestead, Century Family homestead, pardon me, with his wife Marla and their two children, where they operate a custom grazing business. So, Jeremy, the floor is yours. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Sydney, and good evening, everybody. It's good to be together with you. I have really enjoyed uh, what Christine and Bluzette had to share with us, and uh, this is. Um, having discussions like this is just one of the pieces that is so exciting about the forage and grazing industry is that there's so much to learn and so much to uh, so much potential for ways that we can um, manage enhance our management and so I hope to add to the discussion this evening um, to add to where they've taken us with some of the how to's of grazing planning. So what is a grazing plan? A grazing plan is simply a conscious decision of how many animals are going to be where for how long at what time of the year. Um, and as Christine mentioned, the term plan suggests that this is decisions that we're making ahead of time, not just in the heat of the moment. So the cartoon on the right there, next week I'll rotate them to another neighbor's fence line, meets uh, fully meets the definition of a grazing plan and perhaps is the best grazing plan of all. Um, it's not really adequate to try and do a grazing plan just for one pasture or perhaps one of your herds. It's really important that uh, we take a whole farm approach. So we want to be looking at our entire operation and how all the pieces fit together. So for example, Perhaps you lease some public land for, for grazing. Um, fine to have a plan for that public land, but really how it fits into your entire operation is important. And the cows have to be there somewhere every day of the year anyway. There is no one size fits all. There is no prescriptive grazing plan that works best in every situation. There's so many variables. And so a plan always has to be developed for the land, and the people and the animals that are involved in this situation. A number of years ago, I was working in the provincial forest uh, doing grazing plans for cattle in the provincial forest. And one of the challenges that I had when, when training the forestry staff who didn't have a grazing background was to keep them from, once they had seen a grazing plan that was working really well, they really just wanted to copy and paste that to, to have everyone else do to get the same results. And unfortunately, that is just not the way that it works. A grazing plan can be fairly simple or quite detailed, depending on your goals and your resources. 
So it, it may be just some simple uh, decisions, or it could be a fully written plan with colorful maps and a binder full of information. A grazing plan could involve a number of tools that will manipulate grazing. And the one that probably is most uh, comes first to mind is fencing. And certainly I'll talk a little bit more about fencing. Um, and certainly it's a very powerful tool, but fencing is not always feasible or even desirable. Uh, for example, on a uh, native rangeland or perhaps in the forest. And so there are a number of other tools that we can use to manipulate uh, grazing. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, that as well. So while there's not one plan that fits everyone, what we do hold in common are the grazing principles. The first principle is having appropriate stocking rates. Now, sometimes we get right into the moving of the cattle and the timing of the moving of the cattle, and we overlook the importance of having appropriate stocking rates. If you have way too many animals, it doesn't matter how good you are at moving them from paddock to paddock, you're still gonna have an issue. So Sydney mentioned the carrying capacity calculator and um, you can, mostly stocking rates are gonna be based on your past experience. But if you, if you don't have that, maybe it's new pastures, uh, you can get regional stocking rates recommended uh, for each province. And you can also have a look at a webinar that BCRC hosted last year, which was titled Record Keeping for Forage and Grassland Management. Second principle, even distribution of grazing. A typical goal would be to have even utilization of the forage. And that is uh, so that nothing is being wasted or plants are having an unfair advantage. I say that's a typical goal, but, but not absolute. For example, if you're managing for uh, grassland songbirds, uh, you may prefer to have patchy grazing uh, because some species would prefer that for their habitat. The third principle, avoid grazing during sensitive periods. I, I, would, I suggest that avoid grazing might be a little bit of a narrow view to this principle. Um, it's not really just about avoiding grazing at certain times. It's about understanding how the timing of grazing can affect certain plants or certain areas of your pasture. So this might include um, understanding uh, grazing management of alfalfa so that you can minimize the danger of bloat while making good use of the forage, or also um, grazing in the fall as you're getting close to freeze up so that you're not uh, su subjecting alfalfa to being a higher likelihood of winter kill. And lastly, <clears throat> the other essential principle is allowing for effective recovery between grazing events. Luzette did a good job of describing how overgrazing is a function of time. It's not, a, not um, how, how short or tall you leave the grass or how many animals are there. It's strictly a function of time. So are the plants being regrazed while their animals are still there? Or are they are we coming back to that paddock before it's effectively recovered? So how do we actually go about making a grazing plan? <clears throat> First of all, as has been discussed, we need to have our goals set. We have to know what we want before we can find a way to get there. Then next, we're gonna do an inventory. So this would be including your forage resources, your infrastructure, such as fence and water sources, and also the number, the animals that you have. So a, a complete inventory of what you have to deal with. Then we're gonna develop and implement the plan. And a, and a key piece of planning is monitoring. Now, for the most part, I would say that monitoring is simply being observant. So paying attention to your pastures throughout the grazing season and just seeing how are the growth rates, what are the trends in pasture health and maybe plant communities or what are different species are doing in the plant community? 
It's really just a matter of, of paying attention when you're in the pasture. Um, monitoring can also include notes, photographs, or more formal assessments. But the key here is that the plan needs to be regularly updated in order to be useful. So this includes updates during the growing and grazing season and also from year to year. One tool that to me is very important for developing the plan and following maps. So these could be hand-drawn maps uh, or uh, using municipal maps. There's all different um, templates that we can use. Aerial imagery is now readily available to all of us. And it really is nice because it helps you to identify the, the features in the pastures and it can be useful for also for measuring areas and distances. And it just gives a really nice visual of the resource that we're dealing with. One of the most common questions when people are thinking about starting a grazing plan is, what size should the paddocks be? Should they be 80 acres? Should they be 40 acres? And I'm going to suggest that the answer is, it doesn't matter what size the paddocks are. Now, of course, it does matter what size the paddocks are, <laughs> but the point is that we shouldn't be designing our paddocks just based on an arbitrary size of, of acres. <clears throat> Rather, it, we should be planning our paddocks based on controlling the timing of grazing, as we've been discussing. Plus, it should be determined by your forage resources and your herd size, which might change over time. It's better to ask, how many paddocks should I have? And as for laying out of the fence lines, that should be done based on your stock water locations and also um, your forage type. So in many cases, you'll have varying forage and in different paddocks and you wanna split different uh, forage types with fences. What shape should the pad be square? Should they be pie shaped? Should we use alleyways? And I'm going to say again, it doesn't matter. And again, I don't mean it actually doesn't matter. I mean that that's not the most important thing because all the shapes can work. And again, we should be trying to control the timing of grazing and using fencing in a way that makes that more easy to do by managing like with like. So we might have paddocks of all different sizes and shapes within the same grazing cell. Often we're limited by our water stock water locations. So new water sources or pumping schemes are very common and they can greatly enhance your grazing management. So this planning water sources should be done before planning fences, because obviously you have to have a paddock in every one, and the more water options you have, uh, the more options you have with grazing. And the more reliable your water sources are, the less stress you're gonna have uh, when you start to run short of wire, water. Now I mentioned earlier that fencing is not always feasible, and this is, often gonna be found in rangeland type situations. This is a recreational lake that I was involved with a number of years ago. And there was a di desire to, to, keep, uh, to get the cows to spend less time on the beach uh, that was being used for recreational purposes. Now, because of the forested area and topography, and also because of a high volume of recreational traffic, fencing was not a feasible option in this case. So instead, what we did after evaluating the situation was develop two alternate water sources, which actually did quite a nice job of distributing the grazing uh, throughout the whole area better and also reducing um, impact on the lake. Okay, getting back to some theory. How many paddocks is ideal? I would generally suggest the more the merrier, but if we wanna come up with the ideal number of paddocks for your operation, we can use this formula. 
recovery period divided by graze period plus one, where your recovery period is the average time it takes your pastures to recover, to fully recover from a grazing event. And your graze period is the maximum number of days you want them in any paddock before it will regrow so that they can be regrazing. So cool. if your targeted recovery period, uh, sorry, and I was going to say a recovery period could be anywhere from 30 days to 365 days, a full year. It may take paddocks to recover in different uh, settings. So for example, if your recovery target recovery period is 90 days and you want to have a grace period of five days, that would mean you would need 19 paddocks to accomplish this. Now, of course, for most people, when they're starting out with a scheme of planned grazing like this, they're not necessarily going to have 19 paddocks, and that's fine. It's something that you can work towards. Or Bluzette gave a good example for them. I suspect that their graze period is only one day. And uh, by doing math similar to this, they have over 100 paddocks. As well, if you're using electric fence, uh, the which is a powerful tool, and uh, very economical to build. You can also add temporary electric fences to your permanent electric fences to give you more paddocks when you have time. Another good tool and a part of the plan can be a grazing chart. So this can be done on a computer, there's software available for it, or you can use an Excel spreadsheet like this. It can also certainly be done on paper with grazing charts or, or just listing it on in a notebook. But the important pieces are um, laying out ahead of time, this can be done in the winter, is um, what your order of rotation is intended to be and where and how many animals are going to be throughout the season. One of the nice things about having everything laid out like this is it can make your grazing plan fit the rest of your life. So for example, if I know that I need to be near to this corral at a certain time for branding or pulling bulls, I can work that into the plan. Or maybe I know I'm gonna be away for a week in August uh, for a family function and I can I, uh, set my grazing plan to target so that that will work well. Now, one time I was showing this uh, grazing chart like this to a group of ranchers and, and one stuck up their head and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That would never work at our place. There's no way that we could plan this thing in the winter and it's all going to go exactly like that throughout the season. And I, and I laughed and said, well, no, uh, that's a really good point. And actually that is sort of the point is that um, although we're going to plan this ahead of time using averages, in reality, we have to adjust during the growing season through by precipitation and temperature and, and all of these things. And we're gonna be modifying the plan as we go throughout the summer. So I'll talk a minute for how would we do that then? How do we make those adjustments during the growing season? So let's say it's a happy day in June. Uh, looks like there's a little bit of mist in the air and um, we're out checking the cows. And this is what we find. So the question now is, when should we move them? Should we leave them one more day? Should we leave them one more week? This type of thing can keep you guessing all season, can drive you kind of crazy actually. So the answer to that question, when should we move? The answer from the perspective of this paddock that they're in is as soon as possible, we should move them. Now I don't say this paddock is looking chewed down, but from this paddock's perspective, the sooner we can leave, the more cover we can leave behind, the healthier and more productive this paddock will be in the future. So how do we come up with the possible part of as soon as possible? We need to look at the paddocks ahead. Have they fully recovered and are they ready to be grazed again? If so, then it's time to move. And if not, then it's time to move more slowly and graze a little more severely. This paddock looks pretty healthy, so we could afford to take it down shorter if we need to, in order to give the next paddocks their required recovery time. 
this is one of the really helpful mind shifts, um, I guess, that I would highlight today is this notion of not trying to judge your moves by the paddocks that the animals are in now, but by looking ahead of you to the paddocks where you're going to see what is the appropriate timing. This will really help you make the right decisions. So the rule of thumb is when you have fast growth, you want faster moves. And when you're in times of slower growth, you want slower moves. Now, in a way, this is seems a little bit counterintuitive. Times of good growth, it's tempting to leave the cattle there longer because there's still lots for them to eat. There's a couple of issues with that, though. First of all, um, if we're having good growth, these plants are going to be regrowing and we're going to be taking another bite of them or maybe a number of additional bites of them, as Bouzette talked about. And the other challenge can be that then the, the paddocks that are ahead of us, if we're moving slowly and they're growing fast, they can be becoming overly mature uh, and we could be losing forage quality. So times of fast growth, fast moves, slower growth, slow moves, and always looking to the paddock ahead. I'll just quickly mention that our grazing plan can also incorporate the concept of special areas. So we might have patches of weeds, we may have riparian areas that we want to take special care of, or perhaps pastures that are very low in productivity, and we want to find ways to improve that. So we can use the aspect of our plan and the timing. Maybe we can get them to eat that Canada thistle at the right time. Um, maybe we keep them away from the riparian area when it's very soft and you get lots of physical damage from, the, from their hooves. Maybe we can use a high stock density to uh, an animal impact to get this low produ productive area growing more readily again. Now, Christine talked about um, having plans for exceptional circumstances. Now, in Saskatchewan, by far the most common exceptional circumstance is drought. And it's the one that we, th we think most about and, and maybe fear the most. So drought can be very stressful and it's very helpful if we have a bit of a drought plan before we actually get into it. So a drought plan could include some different options and trigger points. So perhaps we'll graze more severely on some of the paddocks that are pretty healthy at the moment. Maybe we can find alternate forage or water sources. So for example, perhaps there's a hay field that we can graze this year or maybe some neighbor's cropland that we could fence and graze. And also knowing a trigger point for destocking. So it may be that by the middle of June, if we haven't had X amount of precipitation, that we're going to start destocking by 10 or 20 percent. Destocking early and having to not to destock as much is way better off than destocking too late, having to destock heavily when everyone else is doing the same thing. And it can be a very comforting feeling to see a few animals go on the trailer and go away. And when it's part of a plan uh, and know that you're making decisions that are the best thing for your operation. And now, of course, uh, Christine rightly pointed out that there's not only drought, that we could be planning for flooding or, or perhaps hail. And those are also good things to give some thought to ahead of time. And just to have some, even if it's just some simple ideas of what would we do if this happened. So I would submit to you then that the results of having a grazing plan will be better decisions, healthier land and livestock, uh, better land utilization, which is important as land values are going up. Another benefit is it's easier to share with other people. So for example, uh, if you have family members that are helping with grazing, it's easier to describe to them uh, what maybe you want them to do or, or how that fits into the big picture if you can show it to them in the plan. Another way of it being easier to share with others, perhaps if you're grazing some public land, it may be easier to defend your use of that public land if you can show that you have a plan in place that's being regularly updated. 
And overall, it just makes grazing management much more enjoyable and has the potential to make it a lot more profitable as well. If we can optimize our management and make good decisions, and because of the nature of the business, every year is different. And so the more tools that we have available to us to adjust to the growing season, um, the easier things will go. Thank you. And I think we'll look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Jeremy. That was great. Yeah. I like that a common thread between what you and Christine said was definitely the, the ability to share it with others. I think a lot of producers that I've come in contact with, they have been doing it for years and they really know when to move their cattle, but having to explain that to somebody else can sometimes be a challenge. So it's just very encouraging to set up a plan and be able to communicate those things a little bit easier. But with that, um, I'm going to encourage our panelists to turn their screens on and we're going to start the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, so if you haven't asked your questions yet, please ask them now. Um, and if any questions arise during um, the Q&A period, go ahead and ask your questions and we'll try to get as many as we can. Um, so starting off, this one is for Christine. Um, as measuring is the basis of pasture management decision, uh, pasture management decisions, can you outline some easy ways to measure my pasture to help me make objective pasture management decisions? Yeah, that's an excellent question because that really is the crux of it. Is uh, we don't have a lot. We ha we have a lot of options to measure pasture. We don't have a lot of easy options to measure pasture. Um, the gold standard in research is a quadrat, which quadrat just means a frame that we know what size it is. Um, so they'll throw the quadrat on the ground and they'll cut all the forage inside it and they'll weigh it and then they'll dry it and they'll weigh it again because we should be thinking about forage as dry matter yield. Cattle eat on a dry matter basis. We balance rations on a dry matter basis. Um, that's very, very accurate. No farmer has time for that. <laughs> so that's the accuracy piece. Um, the other end of the spectrum, a ruler will tell you how tall it is, but it doesn't tell you how thick that stand is. So, you know, if we're talking about grain crops, we'd be talking about plant population per acre. Perennial grasses tiller way more than cereals do. So it's not exactly population, but you know what I mean when I say density. Both of those are important in how much forage is out there. And a ruler can't do the density piece. So I'm not a fan of the ruler, but it is cheap and easy and fast. My favorite tool is the happy medium of those. It's a plate meter. So it's able to quickly combine um, height and density into one number by compressing grass. It only works if it's in a vegetative state and it only works if we've got a calibration. So we have a research project going in Ontario to calibrate a rising plate meter. Um, something else that's in the pipeline research-wise, there's a group um, on the prairies and I think in Ontario that are looking at satellite imagery, trying to calibrate that to see if we can measure uh, from space, which would be super easy if it works. That project hasn't wrapped up yet, so I'm anxiously looking forward to the results. So easy right now is a couple years out. Um, the easiest today would be if you've got good livestock records. So if you know exactly how many head and exactly how much they weigh and what stage of production they were at, you can get some pretty good intake estimates. And if you know exactly how many days they were in that paddock, you can estimate how much forage they ate. So it's not quite yield, but it's a pretty good proxy until we've got an easy measuring approach. Or you can grab a quadrat, which very accurate, but going to take some time. <laughs> Can I add to that? Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the tools that we use, <clears throat> especially when we're out on a pasture tour, that is not super scientific, so it's not extremely accurate, but it is a little bit easier and it's um, more fun if you have more than just yourself. So if you could grab a couple of people and head out into the pasture, is we um, plant ourselves like posts in a square. 
and we ask, you know, is this enough to sustain a cow for a day? Because when we have a herd, especially larger herds, it's hard to uh, visualize. But if we have four people or a shovel, a couple of shovels, and you can create a square that you feel confident will um, be sufficient for one cow for one day, you can begin based on the size of your pasture, you can do the math and figure out that it should be enough. Um, often we uh, calculate it out into, okay, so that's about this many pounds, which is roughly, you know, two and a half bales per acre. Is that what, is that, that what this looks like? And so, Grab something that you have a reference for, if it's bales per acre, or if it's, um, you know, if you tether your milk cow in the yard, you know how much she eats in a day, you know, you can kind of estimate. So then you go out into your paddock and create a square that will sustain one cow for one day. And that works pretty darn well for us here. Thanks, Busette. Okay. Jeremy, do you have anything to add or? Sure, thanks, that gave me time to grab it. Um, I'll, I'll show you another, uh, I agree with those concepts and certainly uh, measuring can be a challenge in, in pasture to do it feasibly. Um, here's, here's one other option that you could consider. Uh, a, a kit like this where we actually have calculated pounds per acre and put it in a plastic bag. And then you can actually take this and, and scrape up a quarter meter square in your pasture and actually compare it to a known reference. So you just hold this in your hand, hold what you can scrape up in your hand and you can actually just compare those two. So that's one way of calibrating your eye. And um, I think that's what it really comes down to is that um, measuring uh, grazing days per acre is probably the most helpful unit. And you can do that by, um, as you're grazing, just giving a, get yourself, okay, here's what it looks like. And then after you've grazed that, you'll know exactly how many animal days per acre you've utilized. And, and then you can slowly tune your eye to that over time. Unfortunately, because every forage stand is different, um, you know, just trying to go by height or something like that is is not usually very precise. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, we're going to move on to the next question. So this is for the group. Um, any other options to planning for drought that are available um, in your guys's areas of expertise? So. Whoever wants to jump on that first, if there's someone, or I can call on someone. I'd, I'd be happy to talk about it, um, having just experienced uh, drought um, this year. Um, I'm, I'm going to divert just a little bit from the grazing plan, um, because I would consider uh, a fundamental aspect of making it through a drought has nothing to do with how much grass you can grow. Um, if you're by yourself or you have a partner or you're in a family, um, it's essential to make sure that you're doing okay first. So whatever it is that you need to do to be at your optimal in order to make it through adverse um, conditions is the first step. Because if you're not in a good place, you're not going to be able to figure out how to cross fence or how to destock or purchase more feed or, you know, have a conversation with a counselor if you can't even function. So it's really important. So I would, I would go back to, if you have a goal, go back to that quality of life goal and say, okay, well, what's really important right now in difficult times, I'm going to focus on that. So I'm better equipped to handle the adverse conditions that going forward. Um, in terms of like technical things, having a plan, just as, as uh, Jeremy and Christine mentioned, is having a plan beforehand, even if it's broad, even if it's those four things, you know, to um, consider options about water. If you've got some idea, that's going to be helpful in the thick of it. Um, and uh, I think monitoring all the time. So monitoring your pasture for sure is really important, but monitoring your personal well-being. You know, I was fine last week, this week I am not functioning. Um, and then being able to be flexible to replan. Okay, so I'm not doing so well. What am I going to do? Does that mean I destock now or not? So I just really want to add the human element. It's such an important piece of that that often is overlooked and often very difficult to confront, but probably one of the most important.
Yeah, I guess I could add to that um, <clears throat> on the as far as the plan itself and some of the aspects of it. From a de-stocking standpoint, I'm um, having identified which animals you would destock first. So that could be um, backgrounder, grasser animals that are not a key part of your herd, or it could be the you know the bottom 15% performings of your herd. If you know it ahead of time again, which animals are going to go, it's a lot easier to let them go. And as far as uh, the other thing, I guess that we maybe haven't touched too much specifically on is having pastures that are resilient. So depending on how you're um, pushing your stocking rate, it's year in and year out is going to do how resilient your pastures are. Maybe if your pastures are all very healthy, you can get through one year of drought, no problem without even changing your grazing plan, or maybe just modifying your moves a little bit. Whereas if you're kind of pushing the envelope every year, it gives you your margin is a lot slimmer and it's going to be a lot tougher, tougher to get through those years. Yeah, to, to Jeremy's point on if it's already well managed, you've got a bit of buffer. Um, I was hearing some reports this summer out of northwestern Ontario, which was the easternmost part of that drought, that pastures that were rotationally grazed typically had a month to six weeks more feed in them than pastures that were continuously stocked. So that's a big difference right there. That makes a huge, huge difference. Um, in terms of what you can do, um, either in the middle of something or ideally before when you're planning, um, your government extension agencies do have resources available. I don't know where they're located in all provinces. I only know where the Ontario stuff is, but they've all got production resources on things like early weaning to reduce forage demand. How do you stretch forage supplies? How do you slow down a grazing rotation? There's, there's production resources out there. Um, the cattle stuff tends to be a bit more uniform province to province because cows are cows than the pasture and forage stuff because the climates that we're in vary so much across this big country, the species that we're growing change depending on where you are. So um, yeah, check, check your province's extension resources. They also often have some resources on like the personal health, mental health stuff that Bluezette talked about. Um, they sometimes have some information about supports in your province as well. So check with um, your ag extension, check with your producer organizations at the provincial level as well, because they'll have some resources that are more specific to your region. I'd like to also add that um, <clears throat> probably the single most thing that you can do in terms of your pasture health is increasing that drought resilience. And that is by having a, a grazing plan to, <clears throat> to implement a grazing plan over multiple years will do more for creating a healthy soil base that will last so much longer. And I know Christine touched on that, but I just really wanted to reiterate it in case it got lost in all of that information. Um, you know, build thatch on your land, cover the bare ground, double your um, effective rainfall by caring for your ecosystem processes, because that will last a lot longer without rain than a conventional method. Thanks everyone. Um, so we have one, um, yeah, just being cognizant of the time, I think this is going to be um, our last question. So is there a tool or a way to help producers find out what the profit per acre on pasture land would be? Um, the person who's asking the question says, this is very hard to measure, but would be beneficial with planning and what's not. So if you guys, I know this is a challenging question, but. Can we answer by <laughs> saying it depends? <laughs> um, I, I was gonna have a longer version of it depends. Cost of production varies hugely farm to farm. So um, any of the partial budget resources that you can get your hands on are helpful tools for kind of working out what are your cost of production? Cause usually they've got all the line items you need. And they might have some sample costs, but where possible, if you know your own costs, stick them in because they're going to be better. The pasture one is the hardest. Um, most of the time I find I'm modifying hay budgets and, you know, crossing out all the equipment that I'm not using in grazing. And then if there's a line item for other, then I put in some figures for fencing and water systems. 
um, and thinking about, you know, how long are those reasonably going to last and, you know, amortizing them over that lifetime and, and sticking in a little bit of just, just fudging it to figure out what the maintenance cost might be. So we don't have a lot of good tools on that, but figuring out that rough cost of production is part of it. And then, you know, okay, if my cost of production per acre is X and I'm producing Y amount of cattle at whatever price, then you can work your profit per acre. So um, it's an extra step because we don't have as many good cost of production resources for pasture, but you can tweak some of the hay stuff pretty easily and, and get into the ballpark. Perfect, thanks. Lucetta, Jeremy, do you have anything to add? I guess I would throw a little bit of a challenge out there about um about knowing your own costs. And, uh, you know, Christine mentioned that if you know your own, that's much better. Um, I would throw out the challenge before figuring out the profit per acre, maybe consider figuring out what does it cost you to run one cow, if it's a cow in this particular instance, or one unit of whatever it is that you produce. And know, know that first, because that's going to go a long way to helping you figure out um, other, you know, profit margins and other, you know, enterprises and kind of whole farm. So maybe taking a look at, at that and getting those numbers first. Jeremy? Awesome. Um, actually, I'm going to ask you guys one more question, if that's all right. Um, so when grazing into the fall, considering the growing peri period is slowing down, how much cover should you leave on that final graze? And how important is it to leave leaf coverage in the fields for plant protection for over the winter? I'd say it depends a little bit on what you're grazing. Um, in the Eastern six provinces, we tend to leave a fair bit of stubble on alfalfa fields to catch snow because if those crowns are exposed to that cold weather, they're, they're much more likely to die. Grasses tend to be a little bit tougher, um, but at green up in the spring, those plants are growing from energy reserves, right? So when snow melts, everything thaws, you don't have green leaves right away. You've got dead brown leaves. The plant is alive, but it doesn't have any green leaf material to do any photosynthesis. It's not able to generate sugar. So that green up and that first growth in the spring is coming from energy reserves in the plant. In grasses, that tends to be in the lower stem. In legumes, those reserves are usually coming from the taproot. But either way, it's stored energy from the grazing season before. So we don't have data from, I can't speak for the West, but we don't have data from the East on exactly how much cover we need to leave in the fall and when we need to leave it to make sure we've got those reserves. There is data from uh, more temperate climates that have similar amounts of precipitation um, and are able to grow similar species to what we grow in the East. Um, and they're saying kind of around 800 pounds of an acre of dry matter is what they want to leave behind in the fall. So pull the cattle out when there's about 800 pounds an acre, and that should be enough for it to fill those energy reserves and be healthy and strong going into the winter. Their climate is milder. They don't necessarily have that dormant period. So there's a lot of caveats because we don't have data. At least I haven't seen data to answer that question extremely specifically, although I'm seeing Grant Lestuka in the chat saying two and a half leaves per grass tiller is a good place to start without a setback next year. And that's probably about that 800 pounds. So I think Grant and I are saying about the same thing. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's important to have something there, but how much may also depend a bit on the type of species. I use, I really only work with tame species uh, east of the Great Lakes, so. Jeremy, do you want to go? Uh, go ahead, Blue. Uh, this is gonna sound like a out, <clears throat> but I'm gonna tell you, leave as much as you possibly can. Whatever, whatever you can, there is, you're not wasting anything. It's all biological capital. It's all going to help you. And if in some years you can't leave anything, um, which may be the case for many people this year, you had to take it all. It's probably okay from time to time to be able to do that. As long as you go back in great years to leaving as much as you possibly can behind. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there, Buzette. 
and uh, and that sort of addresses what I was going to say is that um, sometimes I've heard it said many many times that people say well once once it's not actively growing it doesn't matter you might as well just take it all because it's not doing anything anyway and that's that's really not that's really not true uh, to, to reality and for sure the more you can leave behind uh, the better. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. Um, I just want to thank all of our participants for joining us this evening, and we hope to see you guys again very soon. And to our three incredible uh, speakers, um, it was great having you. Thank you so much for taking your time for doing that to do this and teach us a little bit more about um, coming up with a grazing plan. So with that, uh, I'm going to end the webinar. Uh, thank you all again and have a great evening.